Oh, yes. So, as I say, uh, I normally deal with uh, the Civil War, but I also deal with any time the lower classes get uppity. Last time you saw me, I was talking about the various festivals and celebrations and how they kind of exploded during the medieval and uh, early modern year. This time we will be looking at the Civil War in Chester. And to do that, I'm going to have to give you a quick potted history of the English Civil War, just so you know what's going on. So to begin with, the Civil War. Traditionally, everyone always thinks of this as a religious war. Usually the way people see it is these dashing cavaliers who are talking nonsense, uh, who are Catholic, versus a very Protestant, a Puritan, um, the Roundheads, the Parliamentarians. Roundheads getting their name because uh, the kind of like merchant boys had bowl cuts, and that that's the the stereotype of the of the parliamentarian. But it's actually much more complicated than that. Yes, Charles the first is an inept ruler. He's actually a second son. His uh, older brother dies, uh, so he's not trained to become king the same way. Uh, most kings are. Most kings are prepped. There is also a, a sort of shift in systems. You get your traditional old guard ally with your king and your new up-and-coming gentlemen all ally with the firstborn son. This way everyone hopes that there'll be a bit of change in their lifetime Obviously, it's not so much change as democracies do with new governments, but it gives people the same sort of feeling that even though we're in the same system, things are going to change. However, because the older brother dies, all the people who have allied with him and put political points with him suddenly no longer have a faction to join in with. They can't join with James, Charles's father, and that they haven't yet put the points in with Charles. So there is a lot of uh, political upset. Put on top of that, James has brought in the idea of divine right. Slowly kings have been losing power ever since the Magna Carta. Slowly parliament has been gathering things. The Not only are the traditional landed gentry a challenge to the king, but slowly the upper middle classes, your factory owners and the like, your influential merchants, they are becoming uh, bane to the king. And so James has this idea that he will crack down and become uh, a, a full divine right king, that everything will be by his say so. He pulls it off quite well because he's charismatic. Charles keeps the idea, but is not charismatic. He doesn't have the same influence. He doesn't have the same nouts as his father. Not only that, but we have the emergence of the middle classes and we have kind of multiple middle classes. It's always thought of as traditionally, you know, your landowners, your merchants and your poor people. But we have the emergence of very rich and powerful factory and merchant people like our upper middle classes. We also have our city artisans who are more educated, who trade more, who pass around ideas. And these are very important. And these also bleed in to our religious divide. The, the, the classic English Civil War, our Protestants versus Catholics. So mostly our middle classes be that they are upper middle classes our big land our big um, merchants and factory and trade owning uh lords or our lower middle classes our artisans they tend to be protestant and the reason for this is there's an awful lot of trade with the continent uh the dutch are particularly advanced in the medieval period they are one of the Italy and the Dutch are the two first areas which become in what we would think of as industrialized. They are have dense trading networks and England gets into this 
basically third, it, and it's it overtakes the other countries and becomes in, more industrialized more quickly, which is why we then have the nice industrial revolution and where we start making factories and industry more than everyone else. But we take an awful lot of this Dutch um, Protestantism, and you end up with various religious minorities, which are quite well. The minorities they're quite sizable, and they all have their own views on what they want. There are some extreme Puritans who basically want a religious state, which is going to bring out bring Christ back to England to be King of England and rule it in a uh, all everyone happy type area, a, utop a, a, a religious utopia. We also have the levelers who are suddenly going, I'm not sure about these landowning lords. Maybe we should all be considered in government and maybe we should have things like the vote and the like. And we have the diggers and on the left there we have Ger Gerard Wynne Stanley's uh, 1649 proclamation. They are almost like proto-socialist, proto-Marxist. They believe that everyone should share the uh, boons of the land and that everyone should... That, that no one can really own England. England is a beautiful resource given to us by God and no one no one can own it. And uh, of course, having such, you know, free and nice ideas, they of course get persecuted by every side and do not survive the English Civil War. So we have this religious contention, this contention of this, these two middle classes, that both vie against each other and cause friction there, but also the upper middle class causing friction against the old landholding nobility. And the stereotype is your rich nobles go with the king, they tend to be more Catholic, they tend to have less influence from these Dutch traders, while your both your middle classes go for the parliament and your commoners are kind of brought wherever they are but mostly for the king this painting this is charles holding council the day before the first battle of the english uh, civil war the battle of edge hill it is not a painting of the time this is funny enough the the beautiful long locks of the cavaliers inspired later on people to do a lot of painting. So a lot of the painting of the English Civil War are not contemporary. Um, however, this is a bit of a lie, because even though this is the first battle of the English Civil War, the English Civil War had actually been being fought for a long time before that, so for a few months before that. As everyone realises that fighting's going to uh, uh, happen, the country is all sort of sorting itself out and there are various little sieges and uh, uh, assaults and various little skirmishes. An awful lot of the English Civil War is actually not big battles, but it's either long drawn out sieges or little skirmishes, which are little territorial, you know, 10 people on this side, 10 people on that side, deciding whether this village goes one way or the other. And the... No one really has the idea of tactics and or of, of large scale strategy, sorry, tactics they've got. They've got the idea that you might want to maneuver around this unit here or blow this thing up here, but large strategy, no one has any idea. If they did, the parliamentarians would just make a beeline for the king, take the king, they'd have won. If the royalists had any uh, nous, they would have gone straight for London as soon as they got London. Parliament full. But instead, everyone is grabbing little bits of territory. And this really ties into Chester. You'll, you'll see how Chester continually gets, it, it, it get, draws advantage from this. Not only that, but the, because an awful lot of the merchants are, have links to the Navy, the, the Navy almost uniformly goes for Parliament which really scuppers the king because he is the one who should have international allies. He is the one who has relatives in various places, in Spain, in France. 
yes, they're all distant relatives who war against each other, but he has that divine right power and should be able to get allies, but because of this sort of naval blockade, does not. And this, again, pulls into Chester, as we shall see shortly. So, last little bit, thank you to Peter Gaunt for, for allowing me to steal some of his uh, uh, works. This is um, a maps in grey, I apologise, of the way of the, the land during the English Civil War. The dark areas are royalist, the light areas are parliamentarian. To begin with, the, it looks about even. The uh, parliamentarians have the two biggest cities. They have Bristol, which is kind of like the big economic hub, and they have London, the capital city. Two of the huge areas. But the royalists have large swathes of the north. They've got a lot of nobles, and a lot of these nobles have castles, which while they have old artillery pieces and old muskets and the like, have a lot of them. They, we have the Battle of Edge Hill, which is technically a draw. Both sides hit into each other and then pull back. And everyone really thinks it's going to get solved at Edge Hill. Everyone thinks that one side's going to win on the other. In retrospect, the parliamentarians sort of lose it because they pull back away from Edge Hill. And if the royalists had any sense, they would have just powered through onto London before the whole thing started. But they are cautious, they are worried, and an awful lot of the commanders have no experience. There are only really a few people who do. They have experience from the wars on the continent. England itself has been relatively peaceful, and when it has had wars, it's had little skirmishes rather than proper big battles. So the Royalists control the North, Cornwall, and Wales. Wales, which had been for causing trouble for Charles up in, in his reign, suddenly join in with uh, Charles and become royalist. Charles also does some little deals in Ireland, which gets Ireland on his side, but upsets a lot of people who were sitting on the fence. The royalists have three big prongs. One down the east side of the country, one down the west, <coughs> which will again bring Chester into the fray, it means that lots of armies are moving around Chester and makes Cheshire itself a bit dangerous, but it also keeps Chester safe for the first half of the Civil War. And one up from Cornwall, in through to Exeter and beyond. These three prongs, the eastern one is not very successful, it gets sidetracked, it gets stopped, it has problems at York, um, it, it really doesn't go much places. The western one is actually quite successful, pulls in and hits at Gloucester, and Gloucester is where the royalist forces change in the west. They look like they're going to grab one of the big key cities, and then they fail, an army comes in to relieve Gloucester, they have to run away. Because of this, Rupert, the king's nephew, who has experience, decides we are going to take Bristol, the second city of the country. And he basically wastes an army taking Bristol. And this is when you start to see things turn. Um, and then on the, uh, the south, there is actually a quite successful campaign, which just ends up stalling when the other campaigns and both end up breaking. So the the one and these will I, I'll quickly go through them. I apologise, everyone's getting the full history of the Civil War, but these will come in context when when we're looking at Chester. Chester is under siege from 1643 onwards, but it's a loose siege. So to start off with. Chester is all right. Even with his failed attempt on London, Chester is nowhere near the Civil War. Yeah, there's a few troops sent out, but they're people who volunteer themselves. They're, they're, they're not really to do with Chester. In 1643, Scotland come into the picture. They start attacking down south, and this eastern army that got stuck up north 
get gets harassed by the Scottish and starts pulling the troops down. And this, to me, is the beginning of the end for the uh, Royalists. They've still got a few cards they can play, but they're being attacked from the from London up and from the Scottish down. Even though Scots don't actually win any big battles, they're just providing pressure. And this is when we start seeing Chester getting under siege, and we have these two ones, Bristol and Gloucester, where Gloucester gets a failed siege and Bristol wastes an army. And then as the English Civil War goes on, it's really a case of the parliamentarians mopping up the royalist armies. And each time one of the big armies gets defeated, we then see Chester's hopes dwindle and Chester get under a tighter, nastier siege. So that's what's happening in the big campaigns. In Chester itself, and here we go, this is, if we we're talking about maps before, this is Speed's map. Speed is one of the best cartographers of the time. There's some beautiful uh, painted versions of this as well. Um, and he does maps of the whole countryside and usually the biggest one or two cities within the countryside. So he like, sticks Chester in the middle of Cheshire. As you can see with the Civil War, we have Chester has built up massively. So Hall, you can see on the west, on the east side of Chester, Hall is very well developed. I don't know if you can see my my uh, cursor there, but Hall is the big trading area, and that is where, if you are rich, you live in Hall. There is a lot of big, big buildings that unfortunately get destroyed. So us poor uh, historians and archaeologists can't admire them. There are, there's a fairly big settlement to the north along outside of Northgate and a little bit over the bridge over Hanbridge. Not much aside there. We have two local lads who are actually getting involved within the Civil War in Chester. We have Sir William Brereton, who is one of the local MPs. Chester and Cheshire has two MPs that it returns, and he is one of the local MPs. He is our parliamentarian. And we have John Byron, Lord John Byron, who is a relation of that Byron. He's like a great, 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 great uncle or something like that. He has no kids himself, the, the Lord gets passed down the younger line. Both of these are possibly the negative stereotypes of what a parliamentarian and a royalist is. Brereton is tedious, he is a bit of a whiner, he communicates quite well, uh, he's very good at getting supplies and ideas. He's actually quite good at the grand campaigning. So he sets up in East Cheshire to begin with. And as the Royalist armies are getting defeated in the rest of the country, he is actually making quite good process through Cheshire. Really by winning a battle of having supplies and having things well ordered. He is the sort of man who has any letter sent or given or uh, given to him, cr done out in triplicate, created into big letter books. I imagine in conversation he would be the most boring soul in the world, but luckily for historians, those letter books survive. So I have lots of uh, supplies of letters sent by either side, done out by Brereton and his secretaries. So he's really, really useful to us as a historian, but I feel he might not have been the nicest person to go drinking with. Byron is almost the opposite. Byron, when you get his letters, he has an account after the Civil War to explain why Chester falls and to make sure that none of the blame falls on his head. He is lazy. He doesn't want to take risks, but he is a beautiful writer. His, his turn of phrase is lovely. We have lots of le letters from Brereton and Byron, where Brereton is saying, surrender now. And Byron goes, 
I'll consider it tomorrow morning. I, I, I can't manage, manage thinking about it today. And there were these lovely interactions from them. But he is useless. He is there by privilege of birth. He does not get involved. Indeed, he allows Brereton to basically take Cheshire, a, a rather rich and prosperous area. Brereton manages to take all this lovely cattle land where people are trading in leather, They've got uh, livestock. Chester's, uh, Cheshire is quite fertile. It's the end of glacial strips, so you get lots of different churned up soils. It's not um, agricultural land. It's not, um, sorry, it's not uh, arable land. It's, uh, use, it's pastoral land, but it's very fertile pastoral land. So it actually is getting quite rich at this stage. It's actually a, a, a sign of a, a, a bit more wealth. It's not like the, the bread basket in the south. Uh, and Byron basically lets Brereton take it, all these things, because he doesn't consider it worth it. Chester is the one key place, and that's the only, only thing that matters. Initially, Chester tries to become a neutral city. This happens all over the place, everywhere decides, no, they're happy for the English Civil Wars to be fought. Both Parliament and the King have things that they need to get off their chest. Let them fight it, but let them fight it elsewhere. And you get various statements of neutrality from various places. And some of them are a bit disingenuous. So Exeter, for example, has, Exeter has a large trading network, so it has a big both of these two middle classes it has a big representation of. So it's very Protestant, very parliamentarian, but despite this, decides it's going to be neutral. And indeed there are a few, I think it's to appease a few charismatic Catholic uh, lords that are there. But Chester has a good claim to neutrality. Yes, it's got a lot of merchants, it is a seaport, the, the D has had the silting up problems really created because ships have larger bowels, so they go deeper into the water. It's not actually that much about the silt, it's more about the actual ships that are floating. But it's still a very prosperous port, it still has uh, a lot of money coming in, a lot of trade, and it also has a, it's part of this big um, western strip there are basically two big roads down the country and Chester is along one of these roads so it has north south has our bridge to north wales and it has the tea all good trading routes but it also has lots of links to the crown it was a county it was a, a state in its own right for a long time it was uh, it had its own charter from the king they, P Cheshire men were treated differently during the me medieval period. They were considered the best warriors. They were because they had kind of like the longbow element from Wales, but the civilization element from England. Also, uh, prior to the enriching of Hall during the early modern period, Hall used to be a bit of a uh, Hall Heath. Um, and that used, that used to be where you wanted your assassins from. So all lots of tough men, but maybe not uh, your, your, your nicest of people. So Chester has this big mix of people in it, and it really doesn't know which way to go. Brereton comes towards Chester early on. He thinks, so the king is, is far away. There is a lot of this middle class. Also, there are a lot of monopolies created by the king, which people really don't like. Ones that basically give certain gentry their, um, their, their locks on, maybe not a full monopoly, but sort of duopolies and the like. Chester also has its guilds, and its guilds create ha, have this society called the Brethren. I'm not sure whether they're still in existence now as part of the things, but back then they were sort of like an organised mafia with a wink and a nod from the king. 
And Brereton sees this grip that this sort of mafia who control a lot of the mayoral elections and a lot of the uh, assignments. And he thinks, yeah, I'll come in here, get rid of all these monopolies. The traders will love me. Chester will, will sign for the parliamentarians and we'll have a big win without any fighting. He comes in and he forgets that the brethren employ an awful lot of people. Yeah, they might not be the most liked, but if an awful lot of your employers are saying, nope, we're going with the royalists, people like to be fed. People like to have their food and drink. Um, and Brereton gets swiftly moved out of town. He doesn't, there's not actually any fighting as such, not any bloodshed at least, but uh, there are scuffles and he quickly retreats. The king then comes to Chester and having already thrown out the parliamentarians and the civil war having established itself as not a fight that's going to be dealt with elsewhere, Chester ha has to sign up to the royalists and from then onwards is an established royalist stronghold even if it might have had new, definite neutral leanings. 1643 to 1644, this is when the Royalists are doing well in the country. The Royalists' ch hopes change mid-1643, but by 1644, things are going a bit naff for them. Brereton is in the east. He is getting... He is salami slicing Cheshire and slowly moving towards Chester. The Royalists really want to keep Chester. It is along this long cave, this north south uh, road. They have a lot of supplies in Wales, and because it's a port and to the north, they can sneak the few ships they have with Irish reinforcements here. Again, if the parliamentarians had any nous on strategy, they would have stomped it quickly and broken up all the royalist lines and uh, taken it. But these people do not have the ideas yet. So the royalists are keen on taking Chester and the parliamentarians are a bit half-hearted on it. They, they want it gone, but they want it gone just as much as anything else. They're, they haven't really made any designs on it. So Cheshire sit, Chester sits quite happy with Cheshire being salami sliced off and the, pe the people within Chester decide to make fortifications and they make some grand sweeping fortifications that go all around our settlements along the North Gate, all through Hall, and have this large area so everyone can basically sit in their houses happy knowing that Chester's defended. This is a terrible fortification that Chester does not have enough people in it to defend it and Prince Rupert the king's nephew comes along having actually fought battles on the continent realizes this is a terrible terrible situation and pulls in the defences much, much tighter, brings it halfway through Hall and burns an awful lot of influential people's houses. A lot of people who declared for the Royalists start muttering, maybe we did a bad idea, maybe we should have joined the parliamentarians. And we get one some of the fortifications you can actually see outside of the, the university. There is Prince Rupert's Trench, also uh, Rock Rock Road, or uh, I can't can never remember its other name, Rock Lane, which is a cut designed to bring artillery through, and you can still see how deep the cut is in the land. He reinforces Chester and makes it so it is a a formidable defensive structure. It's not wonderful. And these movement of armies, every time they come, they pull off the experienced, toughened troops, leaving the Green and the Welsh and the Irish 
the Welsh, Welsh and the Irish are considered a bit subhuman at this stage. They're not, they're not real human beings. They're odd, they're weird, they talk an odd language. They're Catholic and they're really Catholic. So um, they're considered lesser people and um, these lesser people along with green troops are left in Chester whilst the elite troops are taken off to the various battles that the Royalists don't lose. And uh, so complete change of the lines in uh, 16, November 1644. By that stage, Brereton has got a siege of the city. It is a very loose siege. It is surrounding this large, this large but reduced fortification. And Chester is struggling but every so often gets relief. It's still got quite a nice easy access to the sea and to Wales so it's only besieged on two sides but it's people are starting to feel under threat and also cannonballs and mortar shells are starting to hit the city and it's and the, the, the city is a the, the wider city. People are not happy. People don't like being shot at. Then in uh, November to October, Chester is looking weak. And finally in October, Brereton manages to storm the outer defences. So this outer structure that uh, Prince Rupert put in place gets removed and Brereton is right against the city walls. And slowly as the months go along, managing to make more and more defences and puts a cannon on Brewers Hall Hill, which is on that left hand side. You can see there's two little houses on Brewers Hall where the golf course is now. He put his biggest gun to uh, besiege the city. Again, neither commander is very good at his job in the siege. Brereton leaves Chester with way too many openings for way too long. When he is besieging, he puts his big cannon up on the hill far away to fire at people in the city, which you don't need to do that. Big cannons are designed to take out city walls. They're designed to take out big, tough fortifications. You want them up close and giving a wallop close. People are scared of gunshot. Human beings, if you're being shot by a gun, it doesn't really matter whether it's a little pebble that you're being shot by or a massive cannonball. You want your little guns up on the top harassing the city and your big guns pressed against them. Meanwhile, Byron is extremely lazy. Every time he has just managed to sit there and somebody has reinforced him, somebody has helped him out. Other settlements, we have beautiful one, there's a siege at Litchfield where they are every couple of minutes, they are sallying out, nicking stuff from the, the besiegers. Again, at uh, Goodrich Castle, similar sort of situation. Not only do they sally out, but they nearly, a, a group of 20 men nearly take Hereford nearby just by sallying out, attacking them with a surprise attack. Chester does none of this. Byron, is incompetent and he's lazy and he has been used to being relieved. He is used to armies knowing that Chester is important, coming back to rescue him. So he does no work. And so the two of them are basically sitting there in a stalemate. Brereton says that he doesn't want to damage the city and because he is unwilling to put in the effort for a short, sharp strike, actually does more damage to the city than he should do. So just to compare those, our 1642 1643 uh, neutrality, you can see that for the early years, Chester's out of the way. When the Covenant Army comes in, that's when they start to be a bit of pressure in. And then it's the defeat at Marston Moor, which allows the first panic on the city. And then as the other armies go, Chester starts losing out. Chester surrenders in February, 1646. The only big turning point after that 
is the fall of Oxford, the royalist capital in the, in the country. So Chester is, while it's not the last to fall up, to fall by any stretch of the imagination, it survives an incredibly long siege and it survives well past when it should have because of these two commanders being late. So what's going on for us, the normal, as, as I, well, Sue hasn't told me, one of you may be a lord, and I apologise if I have not uh, done your family history well, but the rest of us commoners, we are sitting in a, a city under siege, under a loose siege. What's happening to us? So to start off with, when I say commoners, we're not talking always about the most common of people. We are talking about people who can afford to publish their own uh, printed declarations. Here is our declarations of the people of Chester, subtly saying, we're not getting involved in this. We have, and this is one of the Holmes uh, placards. There are a series of Randall Holmes in the, in the city of Chester. They are often mayors or councillors and two of them write diaries uh, that, that continue and give us a beautiful account of Chester from somebody else's view. We do get Byron who writes an account afterwards, basically blaming everyone else for the, the failure of the siege of Chester, despite the fact he did absolutely nothing. And we have Alice Thornton, who is a wonderful di diarist of the time, who is technically a commoner, although she grew up with people in Dublin Castle. She has relatives who have titles. She is not a common commoner. And these ones provide us with some really good day-to-day blow-by-blow accounts of the city. The city itself is modelled. It doesn't like the fact that there's war. War is bad for merchants and Chester is definitely a merchant area. It's bad for merchants who don't specialise in guns. Uh, Hereford and London do very well because they've got big industrial areas. They make lots of guns, big cannons. Uh, indeed, during his siege of uh, Goodrich, the, one of the local uh, one of, one of the generals actually gets the biggest mortar roaring Meg made and so you know puts lots of money into the industry and then there's kind of like a, a techno technological race. But if you're trading in livestock which can die, you are not happy with this. I, I um, apologize for my language, but wars are actually quite good for arable things because blood, bone and shit, the, the three produce of uh, battles, is actually really good for fertilising fields. So um, later on, you'll see some of the arable areas actually do quite well because they've got, they've had a fresh thing of lots of fertiliser, lots of people dying. Um, but Chester does not like it. It does not do well for Cheshire. Um, so we, we are not in a good thing from this war. We do not like it. We get from the people that they are pretty much neutral until William Brereton starts firing mortars at the city. Mortars, unlike, so cannons fire straight usually, and the idea of a cannon is that you want to breach a wall or you want to take people off the wall who are sniping back at you. Mortars go up and over, and they are either a, a stone ball that hits down, or a shell, which is so a metal outer with gunpowder in the middle. Your stereotypical cartoon bomb, where you get the iron shell and then a fuse out of it. These are very scary. Your wooden houses with wattle and daub and thatch on top. If they hit, get hit by a cannonball, indeed the boot improves it. My, my time drinking as a, as a student proves it. It got hit by a cannonball and stood up 
oak beams are very tough and le and very rarely will they shatter the wood and if they do what happens the house goes down mortars on the other hand bring fire they fire up and when they hit they might go they might exp the only the perfect shot would be it never lands it explodes just above building height and spreads fire but timing was a bit awkward with them often they would land and then go out often they would land and then explode and that would bring very scary fire thatch doesn't go up easily it actually is take quite a lot to set thatch on fire but once it goes on fire modern day firefighters have a problem problems putting it out early modern people are scared to death of fire because not only will it destroy your house, but it will destroy all the houses that are nearby. And dying of smoke and fire is not a nice way to go. People in the early modern period are pretty happy with death as, as far as these things go, but that's not a good way to go. So all these people who were a bit eh about the English Civil War suddenly get very royalist. They're, they're, they're fine when the battle's happening elsewhere. They're even fine when it's outside their own city walls and they're starving a little bit. But you shoot at our houses and suddenly the city is royalist. The city is those dastardly curs, those horrible dogs out there. They are firing at our city. And they, you start having a series of writings where everyone's like, let's get these guys. The, um, the only exception to this, the only exception is when the breach happens at the uh, city walls on you know, where the Roman gardens is. You can actually see that there is a there is the breach. You can see like a V shape in the uh, walls. And there's also a beautiful little plaque where you can actually see what it might have looked like. Um, and that's the only time where we get an exception. And it's the only time where it looks like Byron uh, does his job and he actually manages to calm down the populace. Though it might be the populace calmed down on their own and Byron took credit for it. I'm not, uh, he failed at everything else. I'm not, not, not uh, willing to, you know, trust him that much on things. But yes, the city is, is really royalist. And even after that breach, the city is still very royalist. When the parliamentarians attack, they try and assault the breach. Not only do the townsfolk who are the male townsfolk who are nominally soldiers and nominally of the age, but the women get involved in the assault. Earlier in the day, they'd put some beds in, into the, the uh, hole to make to stop cannon fire getting out. But during the assault, they actually get involved with the fighting. And one of our letters actually records that the uh, women put the men to shame. They are so violently uh, protective of their city that they put the men to shame, fighting back these parliamentarian dogs who are coming into their uh, settlement, which I just love as, as this, you know, a time in the medieval period, there's a sort of um, chivalric idea of women protecting the home and therefore often protecting castles and things and being commanders of defenders and um, the early modern it's women are supposed to be a tamer sort and it's more a victorian ideal of these women who are seen uh, seen but not heard um, and chester with its common common women and um latham house with uh, the the lady defending the city, defending the house without worrying about cannon fire the early modern period really really that it's only a thin veneer of pretending to be genteel and uh, delicate so yes the city people are happy during the neutral period they're keeping things out of the way they then get involved then the siege starts to hit in we have our local, so this is Farndon Church. There is a beautiful, uh, this is our Chester Regiment. We're not sure because of how sunlight bleaches glass. Our, the Cheshire Regiment was either in bright orange or it was in mustard yellow. 
uh, the, the colours decay in an odd weighing glass. So there's a bit of a, a debate um, if you want to get into the chemical debate on these things, um, which thing. And here is my uh, Brereton's letterbooks. Um, Francis Gamble is one of our local councillors who uh, commands the local garrison. So he is under Byron, but his job is to actually do the defending. We don't get much from these people until right at the end of the Civil War. And what we start getting then is because of my tedious Brereton, the person who I, I could not sit down with a drink for in real life, he records lots of soldiers' accounts beautifully. So we start getting lovely accounts from any of our soldiers who escape, who get captured, and so here is in six, the 16th of December, 1645. So this is, this is still just shy of three months before Chester surrenders. He, he tells us of the situation there. That there is a shortage of provision, though there yet be yet about 50 live cattle, the better, the better sort, so our upper classes, eat beef and bacon, but have no provision of butter and cheese. And those that are provided eat but one day, meal a day. The poorer sort, which are not a soldier, are ready to starve. However, there is plenty of corn and beer. And he, again, reiterates that the poor people are upset with the mortar. The mortar pieces have done much destruction in breaking and rending. The same are the greatest terror. They expect them nightly at two o'clock. We have accounts of people being up at the middle of night, staying awake to look at the mortar, and also fire arrows. Fire arrows are not like our flaming arrows that you get in TV. They are soaked in saltpeter and they are heated. And the idea is that they are soaked in this volatile thing and they could go up. And it's not a case of um, that they are going to definitely set things on fire immediately. It's the fact that everyone has to start watching for things. So you start having to have somebody awake in your house, keeping an eye on making sure that no mortar shells come along, no fire arrows go in, because a fire arrow might sit in the batch and not set it on fire, but it might set it on fire in two or three hours time even. So there is, there is no feeling of safety. And this is one of the big things that wear down the populace, is that everyone has to stay awake. You get these nightly stargazing things where they start looking at the, uh, make, keeping track of the mortar shells, keeping track of the fire arrows. We get a lovely sarcastic comment about how at Christmas Day, so the mortar, Bet Brereton, firing constantly, doesn't always fire these shells, sometimes fire stone balls to basically keep people panicking, but also save his supplies. Stone balls are much cheaper than shells. But on Christmas day, they send as a Christmas present, three real Granados rather than stone balls get fired over. So people are starting to get weary and this is what's causing problems. We do get from Byron's account that he starts getting people discussing with him and he keeps going, no, no, the king will rescue us. Everything will be fantastic. Might not be. Sorry, uh, uh, Goodman suggests that Chester will hold out, can't hold out for a month. It's definitely going to be a month later, Chester will surrender. A day later, so he is an escaped sentinel. He was on on guard. And this is the easy. If you're going to desert, this is the way to desert. Wait till you're on sentinel. And then John Fletcher is a captured soldier. He sort of comes out for supplies. And it's one of those ones. Was he deserting? Was he um, running away? He paints a dire picture. Only a day later, so it's not like we're talking about much time has passed. And he says that the poor resort are an extreme want and late some of the Welsh soldiers have perished from lack of food. So unlike our picture before of having actually quite a bit of livestock, 50 livestock for a depleted garrison, yeah, it's bad, but it's not 
bad, bad. Uh, there are places where where people are sending their dogs out to eat corpses and uh, then eat the dogs afterwards. Uh, so it's yeah, not not doing doing badly afterwards. Um, and he says that chess is not even going to survive a fortnight. It's going to be gone within there. George Stanford, this one's brilliant. He chucked himself out of, uh, jumped from the wall by the Phoenix Tower, which is, yes, the canal wouldn't have been there, but even then, that is quite a drop that he went for. So it, whether he had a rope or whether he just, uh, a week later, he says that not above 20 live cattle, and this is the thing that I think might kill off the final spark of defiance is that there's little or no corn and that the, through want of malt most of the brewers have left off brewing beer seems to be a very key morale aspect uh, once your beer goes your troops stop fighting and this seems to be a, a general one that the common troop cannot survive without beer and he again says it's going to be a fortnight and while we're at the end of the month, it's still into February, which, which Chester survives. So Chester does survive longer than all these people. But presumably, if they're the ones who are escaping, if they're the ones who are deserting, they might have the lower morale. And they also might be telling Brereton what he wants to hear. Brereton himself is upset with what he's doing. He's a Chester man. He is the MP for Chester. He is really disliking what he's doing and all the time is begging the city please surrender this is this is doing more damage to you than i want to so overall chester and the civil war chester and its place in the in the siege compared to other places chester is actually not very intense. It's very long. It's one of the, it's not the longest siege, but it's one of the longest sieges of the Civil War. But it is not intense. Supplies can get in. There are various letters, Brereton records them, Byron records them, from rich people, rich civilians, various religious people, and various ladies who are getting in or out of the city. It is not a complete sealed place. There is passage that is possible. In the English Civil War likes to still think of itself as a, a friendly war. People understand that, oh, somebody's sick, we'll look after them. It doesn't always go that way. But so it's not, it is permeable. It is permeable. And it's laid back. It's lethargic. There are not sallies out. There are not attempts by the garrison to get out, to grab supplies, to grab guns. The, one of the key ones in every other siege, you get people trying to nick the local. So the defenders will come out and attack and nick either the cattle, the sheep, the grain storage, the beer, something. Um, we don't get that in Chester, which to me suggests not only is Byron incompetent, but also the city isn't in particular bad straits because if you're a common soldier, yeah, you don't going to do the orders, but you get to encourage your, your boss to, can we murder? Your boss is not, your, your leader is not exactly going to say, let's not attack them if the people are starving and demanding that they attack them. So it actually gets off quite lightly. However, I think this lack and this slowness actually does the city and the county itself more damage. More resources are used up in the siege, everything's longer. And while a quick starvation might be bad, the long, slow weakness of it makes the populace unhealthy, we get hit by plague, and by the end of it, it has plants growing in the street of Chester. You, Chester is left as, this, as a minor shadow of its former self. 
thank you very much for listening to me. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Sam. If anyone's got any questions, can you either put them in, ask a question or comments? Oh, flip. I just turned my video on and then managed to switch. That's better. There we go. Okay. I, I have one question. Oh, well, two really. Um, you said women would fight. Would, what, what did they fight with? What were they using? Uh, somebody has a, a record of kitchen knives, but to be honest, I would imagine whatever's at hand, uh, if you're hit by a big log, it doesn't really matter whether it's actually a formed weapon or not. I imagine an awful lot of them will be grabbing the weapons that have been dropped by dead soldiers. I imagine that that's mm -hmm. most of it. There, as I say, there is records of kitchen knives, but apart from that, who knows? Who knows? And who knows whether it's how much blood there is. There are an awful lot of battles where people just run away when they see a mob of people. Because <laughs> you know, if you've got a musket, you fire one shot. If there's 20 of them, there's no way you're gonna kill them all. I'm just gonna run. And there might have been quite a bit of to and fro like that. So mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. idea of that. I, uh, yeah. And um, wouldn't bright orange have been not a good idea from a visibility point of view? Uh, for your uniforms of the soldiers of Chester? So at this stage, you're not actually too worried about being visible because while there are, there, there are there's the emerging idea of snipers, there's the uh, emerging idea, actually, I could aim at that person. I could actually, you know, mm -hmm. that. mostly with, this is early, this is gunpowder. When it hits, it there's masses mm -hmm. of smoke. The whole mm -hmm. field goes dark. Mm -hmm. really what you worry about is being seen by the person next to you so what you'd really like to do is be a really bright colour so that at least your own side doesn't shoot you at least you, they know which uh -huh. direction they're shooting because once you've turned around reloaded everything's in smoke mm -hmm. you can barely see next to each other mm -hmm. um, but also you're not too dangerous to be seen because if you're walking along, people aren't going to shoot at you directly. There are a few times where there's skirmishes with uh, snipers at the city walls, um, but these are individual incidents, and they're almost considered not the norm. An awful lot of time people are walking on the city walls and not being shot at. The only exception is by St. John's, where they have a little gun up in the tower, and that they actually use that to try and clear people on the on the city walls. Mm -hmm. And again, that's not really clear a person, so a person is all right. It's when there's a group of people, that's when they start using it and go and mowing them all down. Okay, so Stuart Murray has asked, what happened to Brereton and to Byron during that decade after the siege while the plants were growing in the streets? So I think Brereton goes back to being a parliamentary, uh, working, goes back to Parliament. Uh, Brereton, so there's, the Parliamentarian Army is very mixed up. There is an awful lot of division within the Parliamentarian Army. And this is why, so Chester is only involved in the first of the English civil wars. There's three of them, really. And um, the part, he is a moderate, so he can quite happily sit in any camp. There's quite, uh, the extreme ones who want peace and votes and everything for everyone, mm -hmm. they're the ones who get killed off very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's ones, there's, a, there's the Putney debates where people debate about what rights human beings should have, and whether the vote should be everyone, every male household owner, anyone who has a, a vested interest in the um, in the country, land, money, uh, or everyone vested interest in the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And um, Brereton just goes back to Parliament. He's all right. He doesn't get uh, got by any of the uh, purges, but also because he's not because he's not like signing Charles's death warrant. When Charles II comes in, he's actually quite magnanimous and uh, quite cleverly magnanimous, and uh, only gets rid of the people who've signed Charles's death warrant. Uh, so he Brereton gets away with that as well. Uh, Byron, I'm not sure what happens to Byron. I'm afraid I know he dies without kids, but but apart from that, I don't know. 
Okay. Uh, Steve Moore would like to know how far from the walls was the port and did it come under any separate attack? So, uh, Chester's actually still the port at that stage. There is uh, one further down, like Saltney's got kind of like a fishing, fishing village at this stage. Uh, and there, so there is, stuff. and I imagine that's where, if you'll have a deep ship, that's where you go. But Chester's, at high tide, Chester's quite happy to get big sailing ships. Indeed, we actually get a warship sail down at one stage, and it, this is at the the turning point where Chester's running low on supplies. And it's where Brereton really realizes that Chester's running low on supplies. Because they sail a warship right by Chester and Chester does not shoot at them. And the thing you do is if you've got you can see a warship and you've got artillery on on land, you shoot at that warship because if they hit you with a cannonball, it's probably gonna knock a bit of earth up, not do much damage. If you hit them, they may sink. So it's like mm -hmm. uh, it's a gamble that anyone would take, and they don't take it, which means they really must be suffering from supplies. So now Chester's actually got its own, it's got the port. Uh, there is a water tower, not the water tower, but a, a water supply tower at the end of uh, Bridge Street. So mm -hmm. it might be there that, that they're doing it, but it also could be the water tower as well. It could be either of those points. Um, I did go to a Civil War reconstruction uh, not reconstruction, but a civil war event, and talked to somebody who said that the the musket balls were being made from lead, and that the way you made them perfectly round was to nibble off the bits from the outside. Were all the soldiers dying from lead poisoning? Uh, I mean, back then you died, you died of poisoning. People people got poisoned. That's uh, uh, one of the things. Um, you, so, ideally, if you are a well-stocked army at this stage, they start producing musket tools en masse. We have the lead shot tower, admittedly that's Napoleonic, but uh, that's a, a later one. But they've got the idea that if you drop lead, it goes into a perfect uh, sphere and you get a very nice shot. Ideally, if you're well-stocked, if your army's well-organized, that's what you'll have. English Civil War did not have very many well-stocked, well-supplied areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you sat right next to London, maybe. Yes, if you're in Bristol, perhaps. Anywhere else, you were scrounging what you could. So there was an awful lot of uh, churches that got their glass and their roofs nicked of all lead so that they could make uh, musket balls. Mm -hmm. and we, we do find quite a few uh, castings on site. You can find bits where they've actually cast the lead and things. Um, mm -hmm. But poisoning was just an accepted thing at that time. If people drank lead. Wa your water containers often had lead linings because lead's not actually reactive. And it's copper, when it goes off, goes poisonous. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually... While it's long-term bills up in your system, short-term it's less likely to kill you. So, okay. Well, I think. Oh no, we've got we've got another question. Woo. On a scale of Quakers equals one and Taliban equals nine, where would you put the Puritans? This is from Jeff Howard. Ooh. So, the fifth mm. monarchy. They were they were insane. The fifth monarchists were definitely a seven or eight, easily possibly going into nine and ten. They were the ones who thought that Christ was going to come back as king of the country as long as we were pious enough. And they were the ones who really pushed for all this no drinking, no celebrating Christmas, no... Um, and remember, Christmas was a debaucherous time. Think of Christmas as, you know... The worst of the races days, you know, when, you know when you mm -hmm. see people mm -hmm. drunk and, and staggering, you know, uh, various uh, bits of debauchery. That was early modern Christmas was not a tame time. We're not talking about pi piety here. Uh, so the fifth monarchists were definite extreme. You've got your diggers who are Protestants, but with like a political message. They're extreme, but they're we would class them as very, very normal people because they want people to live in harmony and everyone to be looked after, which at that time was considered a, a radical thing. 
your levelers were probably your more moderates, they, but they were, again, dangerous when they were wanting the votes for more common people. And then your, your softer Puritans who, who just wanted things to be normal, but without the king and without the Catholic trappings, they would have been considered a two or a three at that stage. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions. Uh, yep, I've... I think that's it. So thank you very much for doing that for us, Sam. It's been really interesting. And uh, just to alert everybody, yeah, we've got plans for a Civil War treasure trail, uh, probably, hopefully, coming out over Christmas. So thanks once again, and goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>